Hello everyone. Welcome to Trinity. And welcome home. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to have you with us today. Remember, you are here on purpose because you have a purpose. If you're new to Trinity, want to find out more about who we are and what we are doing, scan this QR code. The QR code will take you to our link tree with helpful links for giving, the digital message notes, event information, and sign notes for Grove Track, Water Baptism, the Sight and Sound Trip, Your Money Matters Workshop, and our Hello Spot. If you're new to Trinity, the Hello Spot link is there to help you get connected. And if you if you have any questions or want to plan a visit, simply use that link to connect with a member of our Hello team. Today we continue our Hello, My Name Is message series with our special guest, Terry Parkman. So now let's join the choir, vocal team, and band and get today's service started. Have a great Sunday, everyone. Trinity family, would you stand to your feet, put your hands together, lift your voices, because we have joy this morning. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. Shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise We shout out your praise We sing to the God who heals We sing to the God who saves Sing to the God who always makes a way. As he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still all his souls away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. No, we're gonna shout.
in this house and it's because of who our God is because surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And so in every season, in every circumstance, we can come and we can lift our voices and lift our hands and rejoice, not in ourselves, but in our God who is faithful, who is good, who is kind, who is still working, who is still moving. And so today, as we continue to sing, let's do that. Let's lift his name, let's glorify him for his goodness and his faithfulness.
so thankful for God's goodness to us. We see it all the time. Well, we are so happy that we are here all together today. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to those of you who are new. We want to meet you and get you connected here at Trinity. So I encourage you to stop by the hello spot in our lobby. And if you're joining us for the first time digitally, we ask you to check out our hello spot on our website. We have a guest speaker this morning, Terry Parkman, lead campus pastor at River Valley Church, is going to share a word with us. All weekend, he's been challenging 150 students and teenagers to run with perseverance, perspective, and power at RunCon 2024. Students were moved, changed, and transformed, and we can't wait for the word he's going to challenge us with here in the room today. There are so many ways to grow here spiritually at Trinity, and one of those ways is coming up on April the 28th with water baptism. Water baptism is an outward expression of an inward commitment to follow Jesus Christ. And so if you want to be baptized, I encourage you to check out our hello spot. They will get you signed up. And young adults who are in the room and joining us online, there's a fun opportunity for you as well coming up on April 27th. Our young adult carnival is happening. There's going to be food and games. It's going to be an awesome time. So if you want to sign up, go to the hello spot. And step out. Our prayer partners are ready to meet with you and agree with you in prayer. Down front in the cross aisles and in the balcony, prayer partners are going to be in position because they believe God wants to do something in and through you. He wants to bless you today. Meet him. Step out in faith. And we'll agree in prayer together. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, move in us today. Transform us. God, open our hearts and challenge us, God. Help us to strip off distracting things, Lord. Help us to focus on you, God, and do all that you have called us to do in your name. Amen. Amen. And let's worship together.
trusting in the Lord, you sing these songs a little differently. You cry out and you say, I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered with some conviction when you're not doing life in your own power, but you're giving your needs to God. And then you're surrounded by the testimonies that you have because you gave your needs to God. You can say, I'm in the church today because I sought the Lord. I'm married because I sought the Lord. I have kids because I sought the Lord. I'm standing provided for because I sought the Lord. Last Sunday, we uh, went back into this series and we're talking about trusting God with our identities with who we are, with how we express ourselves, with combating the lies that sometimes we feel so strongly, but we have to uproot with the word of God to walk in his blessing. And many of you came forward and you said, hey, I'm trusting God for my loved one, for my friend, for my child, for my parent, for my sibling. And we prayed prayers around this altar and you're still standing on that trust in God. You're still standing on that mission of God that the Holy Spirit is drawing your family member to them. And I just wanted to take a moment and continue to pray that prayer. Um, And maybe you're in the room today and you're here in that process. The Holy Spirit's drawing me, something's going on. I'm investigating it. I'm figuring out, welcome, we're glad you're here. We wanna pray for you. So I just wanna take a moment today and pray and give God our needs and trust in the Lord. Um, And as we do that, we're also gonna pray over the unrest that's happening in the Middle East right now. We're gonna pray over the unrest that's happening in our city and around the world. Would you just lift your hands to heaven today if you're fully surrendered, fully uh, just depending on him. Jesus, we thank you, God, for what you're doing. We pray, God, that you would use the unrest that's happening in the Middle East right now, that you would use it to bring a clear revelation of who you are in our world that would bring people to ultimate rest. They would bring people to ultimate peace and ultimate wholeness. God, use the conflict, use the tension for people to find you and all those, God, caught in the fray. Lord, we pray for safety, God. We pray for security, a covering over them, Lord, that would preserve their lives and most importantly, God, preserve their souls for that revelation of you. We need you, Jesus. We need you to guide as intervention happens. We need you to guide as uh, multiple nations, Lord, get involved and there's threats of escalation. God, we need you to bring about victory and bring about ultimate rest. Jesus, we ask you to be ministering across Baltimore City. Lord, I pray that you would continue to stir a revival in this community, Jesus, where it would be the most important uh, current event that's happening locally is what God is doing through the local church. And Jesus, we pray that it would flow through each of us, God, as we go from this place. And Jesus, we give you today those names that are on the top of our tongues. Lord, they're at the front of our heart. Those people that that you love that are far from you, God, that just need to be found in you. Lord, I pray that today would be a prodigal son come to our senses moment where many people would all of a sudden gain back spiritual sensitivity, gain back perspective, get a clear vision of what this life's all about and who you are. Lord, bring them in to your family. We're trusting you, Jesus. God, this morning, Lord, as we just soak in your word, soak in the truth, I pray you would bring transformation, minister to our hearts from our friend, Terry. And Jesus, I pray that this morning, God, would be a time where we gain wisdom that we can walk out in power. And if you agree with that, in Jesus' name, would you say amen? Amen. Church, it's so good to see you today. Would you turn to two people before you're seated and say, praise God for April. It's getting warm.
Praise God. All blessings flow from the Lord. We're standing in them this morning. I'm going to invite you to find your seat uh, and ask our ushers to come forward for this giving moment. We want to give you an opportunity to be generous today, to be obedient in giving your tithes and offerings. We're a tithing church. We've seen it. We've practiced it. We know uh, it's God's plan for financial blessing in our lives. And also, it's a way to get our hearts right and submitted to the Lord. We also give above and beyond that 10%. We give till it hurts. We sacrifice to see his kingdom go forward. Uh, outside the four walls of our church through many, many missionaries and ministry partners. Um, as our ushers come today, I just want to uh, give you a little update. Many of you know that a Focus Local Kingdom Builders project has been surrounding families of victims of the Key, Key Bridge disaster with love and support. We've been delivering meals. We've been covering bills. We've been connecting um, uh, them with services that they need. And so as we've been doing that, I just wanna let you know uh, that this Saturday we are going to have a funeral here for one of those um, workers, uh, Minor Swasso. We're gonna love on his family and encourage them. Um, it's gonna be a time where we serve our community as well. If you're available to help host or serve that day or serve the luncheon that follows, we'd love for you um, to connect with us at the hello spot today and take a step in that area. That's this upcoming Saturday morning. Would you join me in prayer? Jesus, thank you that we get to be partners and participants in your family and in your mission. God, I pray that as we have submission to your mission, but we would experience commissioning, Lord, the authority and power to live this life beyond ourselves, God. And today as we give, I pray that you would multiply these fishes and loaves, God, these, uh, th these simple resources that we give you, and God, you would do supernatural, mind-blowing things with them. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. We're so glad you're in the house today and online family. I wanna welcome you. So many people are joining us online and connecting uh, to Trinity through YouTube and Facebook and Vimeo. Would you put your hands together for those connecting with us this morning, maybe for the first time? We are just challenging you to take that extra step today. Drop a comment in, click that online hello spot and we're gonna follow up with you. Um, in, in this moment as the ushers are working their way past you, would you stand with me for the Trinity Declaration? We're gonna proclaim this over our lives. This is um, an idea of who we are that we get straight from God's word and it opens us up to receive his word this morning. Let's say it together. I am here on purpose because I have a purpose. I am invited, loved, chosen, and called because God has my full attention and cheerful yes, I am good soil for the good news. I will be faithful with my identity, song, gift, and story. My best days are right in front of me, and I have victory in my life because Jesus lives in me. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I have the privilege of welcoming a friend of Trinity today and an inspiration to me, a Terry Parkman and his wife, Christina, are um, kind of icons for Candace and I. They've been doing ministry um, so well at such a, a great level, setting a fast pace that it always stirs us up when we see what they're doing. If you got a glimpse into the life of Terry Parkman, you would, it's an action movie. You would be wondering if Michael Bay directed it. It's, uh, it's fast moving. And um, God has just blessed him to extend his grace through many organizations all over Minnesota and also around the world, and that includes us this morning. Uh, Terry is the lead campus pastor at River Valley Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. River Valley has 14 campuses, and they're really a, a leading local church in the Assemblies of God. We've been so blessed by many of um, their 
ministry initiatives and the way they do things. We're always gleaning from them. And he was so gracious to bless our students with a word this weekend and stay this morning and bless us. Would you put your hands together for Pastor Terry Parkman? Well, good morning, church. How are you guys doing today? It is an absolute honor. I'm going to move this head right over here so you all can see it. There you go. It's an absolute honor for me uh, to be able to be here with you, Pastor Anthony and Candace. Thank you so much for uh, having me out. It is really a privilege. Can we give it up for your lead pastor? Amazing, incredible leaders. I love it. And man, that worship was incredible. I mean, absolutely incredible. How could your week not have victory in it after a worship set like that? Let's give it up for everybody who just ushered us in to the presence of God. I always say the best worship teams can usher us to God's throne and then disappear, right? So all that's left is the presence of God and you. That was absolutely incredible. I come bringing greetings from my family, my wife, Christina, my two daughters, Avalie and Nova. Everybody say, aw. There they are. There they are. My daughters are uh, beautiful. They're the loves of our life. They are equal parts sunshine combined with a Category 5 hurricane, all right? How many, how many of y'all got kids? You know what it is, right? They're like, they're like that. My, my daughter's got some crazy attitude right now. One just turned 13, one turned eight going on 18. And uh, I had her up on the sink the other day. I'm trying to braid her hair, right? I'm a dad trying to braid hair. It was catastrophic. And she goes, Daddy, can you do a French braid? I'm like, girl, I can't even do an English braid. What, what, what are you talking about? And she rolled her eyes at me. I said, that's how I know sin is real right there. Let's pray. I'm going to lay hands slain in the spirit in Jesus' name. And my wife, Christina, and I, we just celebrated 20 years of marriage. Man. God hasn't healed her of her blindness. She doesn't know how ugly I am yet. Don't tell her. No, I'm kidding. She ain't blind. I had somebody come up. I made that joke, and they're like, is your wife really blind? I'm like, no, that's just a bad joke. I'm sorry. I just need the pity laughs. You know what pastors get. And, uh, and for our honeymoon, we went to Maui. Our 10-year, we went to Maui. And then just to celebrate our 20-year, we went back to Maui and spent all of our money. Don't tell Dave Ramsey. I don't want him to know, but we spent it all. And uh, I remember the first time we went and we're driving around uh, Hope Maui and we see all these like really nice, um, beautiful properties, right? And so I make a little joke. I'm like, baby, my wedding gift to you is I got us a second home in Hawaii. She said, Psh, you're going to be a pastor. I know you ain't making that kind of money. And so it kind of got me thinking, like, I wonder what the most valuable piece of property on the world today, in the world today is. So I looked it up after we had gotten home and I found this blog by this guy named Todd Henry. And he says, the most valuable piece of property in the world today isn't found in the oil fields of the Middle East. It's not found on the island of Manhattan. It's not found even by your local coffee shop. He said, no, the most valuable piece of property in the world today is a graveyard. Because buried in every graveyard is every unrealized dream. Buried in every graveyard is every unreconciled relationship, every unwritten song. Buried in every graveyard is potential that died inside of people. And he said, I don't want to die with potential still inside of me. I want to die empty. I want to die having wrung out my life of all the potential that God has placed inside of me to use it for this world. And my friends, can I tell you today, potential is not meant to, be sta not meant to stay inside of you. Back in the day, I remember people saying to me, Terry, you got potential. I was like, yeah, I do. Did you hear that? Ma, did you hear that? They said I had potential. But you know what potential is? It's a lot of almost. It's a lot of not quite yet. You see, potential is just that. If Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time, come on, somebody, if Michael Jordan had never picked up a basketball, then it doesn't matter how much potential he had for greatness that would die inside of him. If Michelangelo, the painter, not the Ninja Turtle, if Michelangelo never picked up a paintbrush, then the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel would have never been painted and that potential would have died inside of him. You see, we were created just to be satisfied with the gifts and the callings and the potential that God has given us. We weren't meant to sit on the sidelines as the world goes by us, leaving that potential inside of us, thinking to ourselves, who am I? I'm a nobody. I'm overlooked. I'm, so, I'm, I'm a nobody. Why, why should I use my gifts and my callings and my talents and my potential when there's so many other people using theirs Listen, you don't need to look for, to other people for, for permission to do the thing that God has called and created you to do. You don't need confirmation. Confirmation isn't biblical. 
We look for confirmation when we don't believe what a holy God told us in the first place. We don't need confirmation. We need conviction. Amen? We need conviction to release that potential inside of us. And we can't allow where we're at. We can't allow who we think we are as being somebody that's maybe overlooked or bypassed or anything to hold us back. No, we have to release that. Why? Because I believe that in this generation today, God is doing a brand new thing. How many of you believe that God is doing a brand new thing? Amen. I believe he's doing a brand new thing. It says in Isaiah 43, 19, for I am about to do a brand new thing. See, I told you. He said, I'm about to do a brand new thing. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? And I love those first couple lines. I've already begun, but he ends it with, don't you see it? What's keeping you blind from seeing this new thing that I am doing in and amongst you? And if you read the context, the people of Israel were so focused on what they, uh, on themselves that they were missing out on what God was doing. They saw themselves as defeated at that time. They saw themselves as broken at that time. They saw themselves as overlooked. And so God is speaking to the prophet Isaiah, trying to encourage them, saying, no, 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 no. You ain't going to stay here forever. I'm doing a new thing. Don't you see it? Lift your eyes and see what I'm doing in your life. Don't look at yourself out of your own strength. Release what I have placed in you to change the world around you. And my friends, when God does a new thing, it's not an upgrade of your best yesterday. Oh, come on. So many of us are like, God, do a new thing in me. So you think of your best yesterday, give it a slight upgrade and call that the new thing. No, no, no. New means new. And if I am going to use the potential that God has placed inside of me, I can't look back to yesterday. Why? Because yesterday has never been where God is about to take me. Ooh, tweet that. At Terry Parkman, please. God is going to use you in ways and you can't, that you've never imagined and you can't look to what happened yesterday because yesterday has never been where God is about to take you. I'm kind of a science geek, an archaeology geek. I'm, I'm just a geek, okay? And uh, I, I love watching these science experiments and I watched a science experiment about how scientists trained fleas, all right? So if you didn't know, fleas have crazy jumping power. That's how they get on animals. Like they can jump 900 times their height. I mean, just crazy jumper. So scientists said if we could train fleas to not jump high, maybe they would, they would, die, they would, they would just like die off. So they did an experiment, and they put uh, fleas in a jar, and they put a lid on the jar. And these little fleas are jumping. You can hear, hear them hitting their little flea heads up against the lid, right? And it keeps jumping. But after a few hours, they stopped hitting the lid and only jumped as high as right beneath the lid. Why? Because the pain of hitting their limit was too great. So they stopped releasing the potential inside of them. And what's wild about this is three days later, scientists took the lid off. They poured the fleas out. And as they poured the fleas out, not only did the fleas stay jumping as high as the lid, even though they saw they had no limit, the remembrance of the pain of hitting that limit kept them from jumping as high as they were created. And not only that, but they passed their limitations on to their offspring. Hello, parents. Hello, grandparents. Hello, friends. These fleas pass their limitations on to their offspring, so these offspring, born with the potential of jumping 900 times their height, just jumped as high as their parents taught them to. Oh, my goodness, that preaches. That's a whole different message. Bring me back. I'll do that one, too. But then they jumped only as high as that. And every time they would introduce a group of fleas that accepted their limitations to another group of fleas that didn't, the group of fleas that accepted their limita uh, limitations would teach the other ones how to jump lower. But there's this one flea, they called it Flea Zero. It's like this flea didn't get the memo, you know, because they put it in the jar for three days, they dumped it out, and this flea just kept jumping as high as it did as it was before it was put in the jar. So they're like, stupid flea, let's put it in the jar for seven days. And after seven days, it was jumping higher. It's like it didn't get the memo. And they're like, there must be something wrong with this flea that didn't accept its limitations. So they said, what would happen if we introduced this flea to a group of fleas that accepted their limitations? And so it did. And within 20 minutes, that flea that didn't accept its limitations taught the other ones how to remember what that potential inside of them could do. Which one are you today? I bet you didn't think a flea could preach. Listen. Which one are you? Are you the one passing on your limitations or teaching people and helping them to remember what it's like to release what's inside of them? 
You see, just like the people of Israel, when Isaiah was talking to them, saying, God's doing a brand new thing, don't you see it? They had accepted these limitations. They thought God had overlooked them. They thought that God had bypassed them. They thought that God had forgotten about them. And can I tell you today, he hasn't. You might be in these seats today thinking that God has overlooked you, that people have overlooked you, that you are sitting quietly on the sidelines of society watching everybody do the thing that you think that you're called and created to do, but you're afraid to step out because, well, if they're doing it, who am I to do it? And because you feel overlooked and on the fringes of God's vision, you're just sitting on the sidelines. Today, if you're taking notes, and you should be because when you write it down on paper, you write it on your heart. This message is called, Hello, My Name is Overlooked. Come on, we're going somewhere with this. Hello, my name is Overlooked. And when I look through the word of God, and I think of somebody who was clearly overlooked, but also somebody who clearly didn't accept their limitations, there's only one person that comes to the surface, and his name is Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is that guy. He was a guy who was completely overlooked. You see, this is a story where Jesus is for sure on the scene, but it's one of the few times in the Bible where Jesus shows up, but then he takes a step back so that humanity can shine in the way it was created to shine. We see it in a similar place with the, women, with, with, with the woman with the issue of blood. Like, Jesus is there for sure, but everybody's focused on this woman who is persevering to touch the hem of his garment. And it reminds us to do the same. Bartimaeus, it's a similar kind of story. Jesus is on the scene, but all eyes are on Bartimaeus. And we pick up in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Let's go there. And so they, the disciples and Jesus, reached Jericho. And later, as Jesus and his disciples left town, a great crowd was following. And a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road as Jesus was going by. And when Bartimaeus heard that Jesus from Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, some of the other people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, he stopped and he said, tell him to come here. And so they, told the, they called the blind man and said, cheer up. Come on, he's calling you. And Bartimaeus threw aside his cloak. We're going to come back to that. That's very important. He threw aside his cloak. He jumped up and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. Teacher, the blind man said, I want to see. I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has healed you. And instantly the blind man could see. Now, the story is significant because in light of his condition and in the face of the crowds trying to hush him, and in spite of his social status, Bartimaeus broke rank. He broke the faith barrier, into the faith barrier between the natural and the supernatural and became the man that God created him to be. And in response, Jesus asks him one question. And it's a question that he's asking each and every single one of us here this morning. And that question is, what do you want me to do for you? Every single time you walk into the presence of God, you have an opportunity to answer that. And imagine you got one shot. Bartimaeus had one chance. They were leaving town already. The gates of the city were about to be closed. He sees Jesus coming by, and he's crying out, and, he's cr and Jesus says, come to me, bring him to me. So he stands before Jesus, and Jesus says, what? He sees that he's blind. He knows what the need is. But he says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you say right now? Do you ask God for something possible? Do you ask God to make you more comfortable in your misery? Do you ask God to help you be comfortable in being overlooked and to take away your, your anxiety or your frustration or your fear? Or do you ask God for something that is going to automatically change you and transform you and force you into the life he has created you to live? You got one shot, and he's asking each of you, and before you leave this room here today, you have to answer that question. What do you want me to do for you? And the very first thing that Bartimaeus did when Jesus came by is he shattered a ceiling. You got to look beyond your circumstances. I know you might feel overlooked in the room, that nobody sees you, that nobody cares about you, that you're suffering silently. But can I tell you today, Jesus sees you. 
Jesus sees you, his name. He has a name that literally says he sees you. We got Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals us, Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides, and Jehovah El Roy, the God who sees. The very name of God means he sees you, and he sees where you're at, and guess what? He still calls you out, and he still calls you forward. Going back to Isaiah, he's like, don't you see it? I see you. It's time to come forward. Bartimaeus broke through his ceilings. You got to look beyond your circumstances. You see, Bartimaeus, before he got his miracle, was the poster boy for low ceilings. He fell quietly in line with what society said were acceptable parameters for a man in his condition. He was a blind beggar. He had three strikes. First of all, he was blind. In Bible times, if you were blind, you couldn't have a job. You couldn't have a job. And if you couldn't have a job, you had no identity because you were known by what you do. And therefore, you were an outcast. Strike one, he was blind. Strike two, he had no name. And you say, Pastor Terry, what do you mean he had no name? Bar Timaeus literally means the son of Timaeus. This dude was so overlooked that they didn't even bother to know who he was. They're walking and he's saying, have mercy on me, asking for money. And people are like, who's that beggar? And they're like, ah, he's the son of Timaeus. You know Timaeus, right? Yeah, yeah, what's his name? I don't know his name. He's just Timaeus' kid. Man, talk about somebody that's overlooked. So he's blind, he has no name, and number three, he was a beggar. What's so bad with being a beggar? Well, in that day, to be a beggar and get money from people, you had to go to a Roman official, and you had to show the Roman official that the only way you could earn income so that you could use that money to buy some food was to beg. And if they deemed you to be a safe beggar, they would give you what they would call a beggar's cloak. And you had to put that beggar's cloak over your shoulders, and then you had to go somewhere called Beggar's Row and sit on Beggar's Row uh, leading to the temple, and you could beg then for money. But you would be sitting there with like 20 other people who are begging. And so all of them, as they're sitting there begging, they had to be very quiet because if you disturb the peace, if you yell, if you're going after somebody for money, then a Roman official will come over to you and take away your beggar's cloak, and then there's no uh, other way for you to earn money again, ever. And the common phrase, as you sit on beggar's row, begging for money very quietly, as you have 20 other people whispering, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. As you would sit there on beggar's row, you would say, have mercy on me. See, see me. Look at me. See me. Help me to stay comfortable where I'm at. I know I don't belong where you are, but will you see me and just get, be a little bit generous and just so I can make it see me? And that was, a, that was the cry of the overlooked on beggar's row. But you could under, never in any under circumstances be loud or else you would lose it. So the son of Timaeus was a nameless, sightless, homeless beggar that fell neatly in line with what society was comfortable with. He was a nobody, left to sit quietly on the sidelines while other people got to live their lives. He was overlooked. He was overlooked. And so here he is day by day comparing his life to other people like some of you might be. You might be comparing your life to your neighbor or somebody at work or somebody in church. You might be comparing your life to another family member and then grumbling inside your spirit because you're like, man, why not me? You might be sitting there comparing. I mean, this is a society that says that we want to rewrite our story, that we want to live our own destinies, that we want to blaze our own trails. So what do we do? We compare. We go on social media to see how other people are doing the very thing that God has called and created us to do. I'm here to tell you today, my friends, stop comparing. Why? Because you were not created in the image of a celebrity or an influencer. You were not created in the image of a pastor or a worship team. You were created in the image of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So let's stop comparing comparing ourselves today. I love how Bartimaeus, even though he was a nobody, got noticed by God. Even though he was, an, he was overlooked, Jesus saw him. In 1 Corinthians 1.27, it says, isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? That he chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. Who's a nobody in the room? I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to be a nobody today. I ain't trying to be a somebody. I'm going to try to be a nobody so that God 
could use me in great ways so that he could see me. Listen, people want to keep your limits in place. A lot of people want to keep you overlooked. But just like Bartimaeus, be willing to disrupt society and shake them out of their comfort zones and drive them to the feet of Jesus by releasing the potential and the gifts and the callings of God that he has placed in you. Amen? Amen. So here he is, day in and day out. Bartimaeus is shaking his cup clinging around his coins, a few that he has in there, saying, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, to passerbys until one day Bartimaeus broke through when the Son of God shows up on the scene. He broke his limits and he went when, where other people weren't willing to go. On that day when the sound of the Savior fell upon Bartimaeus' ears, the pleas of a nobody melted away into the cries of a somebody as he's sitting there and he's like, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth is coming? Ah, have mercy on me. And maybe he asked for money with the first have mercy on me, but he didn't do it with the last have mercy on me. He's like, I got one shot. Jesus is going by. I'm not going to miss my opportunity. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet. No, you be quiet. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus, don't you know they're going to take away your cloak? I don't care. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, my friends. What do your prayers look like when you need God to see you, when you need God to notice you? Are you sitting on the sidelines not wanting to disrupt heaven and saying, Jesus, hey, are you there, Jesus? Jesus, are you there? I love how the Bible talks to us about it in Luke eleven nine. 9. It says, keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. Bartimaeus didn't stay quiet. He kept persisting. Jesus doesn't tell us to keep on knocking because he likes the sound of knocking. How many of y'all got kids that won't stop knocking on the door? I'm serious. Like the minute I go into my room and close the door, daddy, 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 hey, give me a minute, daddy. And I open the door, I'm like, what? They're like, I don't watch TV. I'm like, man, I don't care. Go turn it on. Go turn on TV. Go do what you want to do, you know? You don't have to ask me permission. Just go do it. Jesus isn't saying knock because I like the sound of knocking. What he's saying is the more you knock, the more the thing you ask for aligns with my will. Why? Because when you ask anything according to his will, it will be done. So, for example, like we were just had run conference. Amazing conference, by the way. So much life transformation in the next generation. Love you guys. Okay. It was an amazing conference, but say, for example, I'm praying for the conference, and I say, Lord God, I pray for run conference and that you would fill it with hundreds of students, God, so it looks good on Instagram. All right, all right, all right. Is that according to as well? Maybe quite not, but you know what? I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to keep asking God, and I'm going to spend time in the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you bring hundreds of students to run conference, God, so that every seat is filled and we have good numbers. Almost, but not quite. I'm not quite in line with his will. God, I thank you so much that you have provided Run Conference. And I thank you, God, it doesn't matter how many people show up on Instagram, how many people show up on the seat. So what matters is that you show up. So I pray that you bring in students for life transformation. And God says, now the thing you have asked for is in line with my will. That's why he says, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. The first son of David had mercy on me might have been about money. But the last son of David had mercy on me might have been about life transformation. What thing have you stopped short of asking for? Many of your prayers are like the first, have mercy on me. You're like, Jesus? Hello? Oh, God doesn't want to answer my prayer. Hey, man, have you prayed about it? Yeah, but God hasn't come through. God hasn't come through. I don't think you've come through with the thing you've asked for. I don't think you really know what you want to ask for. If you're feeling overlooked and unseen today, maybe you need to storm the gates of heaven and knock until they fall down so you can walk boldly into the presence of God and receive the blessing that he has for you. I've been talking to my wife a lot about not leaving a blessing on the table. That's another sermon. Don't leave a blessing on the table. We're talking about giving. We're talking about generosity. We're talking about tithes. And I said, you know what? I don't want to leave a blessing on the table. If God's got blessings stored up for me, I want them today. And how many blessings do we leave on the table by not aligning our ask with his will? And so here he is. Bartimaeus is saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And as the pleas of a nobody gave way to the cries of the somebody, his comfort zones melted away into a plea of desperation. And he bombarded God's attention with his prayers. Listen, when you're trying to get God's attention, you can't listen to the crowd. When you need to get God's attention and his presence in your life, you don't open social media, you open his word. Why? Because the word of God is the will of God. When you pray his word, you pray his will. 
can't listen to the crowd. As the worship team comes up, the lies of the enemy might creep in when you pray. When you're feeling overlooked and you would just dare to step out and say, God, I believe that you're doing something new. Release this potential inside of me. Make me the man, make me the woman that you created me to be. Immediately the lies of the enemy are going to come in. You're gonna think of the limitations of your past. You're gonna think of the limitations of your context of where you came from. You're gonna look at the size of your bank account or maybe the talent in your heart. But when Jesus shows up on the scene, your past no longer holds sway in your life, my friends. I don't know about you, but I didn't get saved to simply exist and breathe to death. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't get saved to just not do bad things. I got saved to partner with Jesus Christ in his redemptive journey and ripping sin from souls and loving people away from suicide leaps and redeeming all the things that the enemy tried to take and robbing hell and populating heaven. That's why I'm a Christian today. That's why I'm a believer. I am not meant, and you are not meant, to remain overlooked or to live like you're overlooked when you're not really overlooked because God sees you. So he keeps persisting and shouting and disturbing the peace and this man doesn't give a care who notices. He doesn't give a care and it's what Jesus encourages us to do. Not only did he bombard God with his request, but he positioned him right in front of God. And he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Everybody's like, cheer up. I can imagine that Roman official's walking over him. He's like, I'm going to take this man's cloak. But before a Roman official could get to him, when Jesus called him over, the Bible says that when he stood up, he didn't say, oh, Jesus is calling me. Let me grab this cloak. Let me get my bedroll. Let me, get, let, let, me, let me grab everything and just put it over. No, the Bible says that when he stood up, he threw his cloak down. Ooh, he threw that cloak down. So many of us, we bring the cloak into the presence of God and use it as a filter through which God can interact with us. And God's like, I'm not trying to interact with you that way. But you bring it into the presence of God because you're afraid of who you are without your limitations. You're afraid of who you are without the things holding you back. The Bible says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Maybe... You ain't getting your answers, prayer, pray, uh, prayers answered because you're praying with the spirit that God didn't give you. Oh God, I'm afraid this can happen. I'm afraid of who I am without this cloak. I mean, I know it's, it holds me back, but it's kind of how people know me. It's kind of like how I've seen myself. What are my family going to say? And we're afraid. And we pray with the spirit of fear. The God did not give you a spirit of fear, so why would he honor a prayer? Pray to the spirit he didn't give you. He's going to honor you. got to switch the energy and pray with power, love, and a sound mind. Man, I remember we adopted our little girl from China, and she had severe special needs. I won't go into it. But basically, when we got this girl, she's 17 months old and 11 pounds. Very, very severely malnourished, had a cleft lip and palate, and couldn't get food or nourishment. Maybe e eating six ounces of food a day. Tiny. She didn't love us, like us to hold her. She would always push and kick as a 17-month-old. And like... It was one of those moments where we're like first time parents of a special need kid from another country. And we're like, God, we don't, we don't know what to do. And so every single night my daughter would fall asleep in China, so when we're in China, would fall asleep crying. My wife would fall asleep crying and I would just be angry praying to God. You ever mad pray? Like, I was just like, God, this is dumb. This is not, how, I'm, I'm a first time dad. I don't think I know how to do this. I don't know how to take care of this girl. She has so many special needs, God, I don't know what to do. And I would always fall asleep because I fall asleep praying all the time. And so day after day, my wife would fall asleep crying, my daughter would fall asleep crying, and I would just be angry praying to God. And about after one week of doing this, I'm doing the same thing, and God finally says, Terry, shut up. It wasn't be still, my son. It was like, man, just listen up for a minute. Stop talking. Stop chirping. He said, don't you think I knew her name before you were even born? Don't you think I knew that she would end up in your family before you even decided to adopt? Don't you think I have a purpose and a plan for her life? How about you stop praying like a punk and start praying like a dad? And I said, ooh, okay, God. I said, fine, God, I thank you for this little girl, and I know that she's got a purpose on her life. The devil didn't get this one. You have a purpose, you got a plan, and she is going to give glory to your life. The next morning I woke up, I heard my wife sobbing. I look over, I'm thinking, here we go again. But for the first time, my daughter is allowing my wife to hold her. My daughter is touching my wife's face, and my wife is cuddling at my daughter. And that began this pathway of healing. My friends, you were not created with a spirit of fear. 
You were not created to stay here on the curb. You were not created to take a cloak into the presence of God and request everything through the lens of this cloak. Be like Bartimaeus and take that cloak. And he's like, he's calling me. I'm throwing it down. I'm burning my back doors. I'm, I'm getting rid of my plan B's because God is my plan A. If he don't come through, nobody's coming through. But I ain't going back to this place. You are not overlooked. God sees you. Pray like God sees you. Live like God sees you. He sees you. If you think, man, I'm just a number here, you're not just a number in heaven. He knows the hairs on your head or the hairs you don't have on your head. He knows. He's in your life. He's in your business. He's in your world. He's in your family. He sees you. The only thing the devil can try to do to slow you down is to try to make you believe the lie that God doesn't. And so here he is coming into the presence of God, breaking his limitations. My friends, you got to abandon the cloak of fear if you're going to see that breakthrough in your life. On that day, Bartimaeus became part of the solution when he broke free from that victim mentality of being overlooked, and he believed in something greater. And again, my friends, when Jesus came up to him, he asked him one question. What do you want me to do for you? Man, don't leave this place without answering that question. Don't leave this place the same way you were when you walked in. Leave this place transformed. Leave this place transformed. Far be it from us to walk into the presence of a transforming God and leave the same way. And when you pray, when you pray today for God to come through, don't beg for crumbs. There's so many times we pray and we're God, God, can I get just a little bit of what you have for me? Can I just get a little taste? Man, I don't want a taste. I want the whole buffet. Close the restaurant down and set me a table. That's what God wants to do in your life. Don't beg for crumbs from the bread of life. Beg for the whole, give the whole thing because he's got those blessings ready for you. Across this room, I want you to bow your heads. I want you to bow your heads. And there are two altar calls here today. Number one, you might be saying, Pastor Terry, I need that in my life, but I don't even know the bread of life. I don't even know Jesus Christ. In a moment, we're going to ask you to lift your hand because I want to pray for you to receive Christ. The second group of you are those who feel overlooked or you've been sitting on the sidelines letting all your prayers be prayed through the lens of fear or through the lens of that cloak. And today is the day where you say, Son of, G Son of God, have mercy on me, and you throw that cloak down. So in this room today, you know transformation is here for you. You know that life change is here for you, that forgiveness of your sins and forgiveness of your past is here for you. And maybe for the first time, you need to say, God, I need to give you my life, or maybe you just need to recommit. With every head bowed and every eye closed, on the count of three, I just want you to lift a hand. One, two, three. Come on, raise that if that's you. Praise God. Thank you for your courage. Hands going up all over the room. Thank you. God sees you. God sees you. I'm going to pray a prayer. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart, and you repent of your sins, and you confess that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So Jesus, we believe. We believe that you died on the cross for our sins. Jesus, when you were nailed to the cross, it wasn't just you, but it was our sins that were nailed to the cross. Jesus, when you died on the cross, my sin died. When you were buried in the grave, my sin was buried. But when you rose from the dead three days later, my sin stayed in the dirt, and you rose to eternal life. So I repent of all my sins that keep me from having a relationship with you. And I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Can we give God praise for everybody that made that prayer their own today? And the last prayer, I want us all to stand to our feet as we get ready for worship. The last prayer I want to pray is for those of you who are willing to throw down that cloak and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I'm leaving my past behind and I'm stepping forward into what you have for me. God, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So I want you all to close your eyes. What's your cloak? What's your cloak? Imagine yourself holding a cloak in your hand. Fill that cloak with every hesitation. Fill that cloak with every fear. Fear that cloak with the anxiety. Fill that cloak with depression. Fill that cloak with addiction. Fill that cloak with limitations. Because in a minute, you're going to say, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, and you're going to throw that down. Jesus, let us not leave this place the same people we were when we walked in, but let us leave changed and transformed 
in Jesus' name. Forgive us, God, for bringing a cloak into the presence of the one who gives us a new life and and makes us a new creation. Lord, the cloak of the world, the cloak that tells the world that we need to stay where we are, God, that is not what you place on our shoulders. Instead, you don't give us a cloak. You give us a new name. You give us a new name, and you call us by the name of your son. So, Lord, forgive us for holding back. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. Father, as we go into a time of worship, I pray that not only is this a time of praising you, God, but also making our requests before you. I believe, God, that there's going to be prayers for healing. In Jesus' name, I pray that healing happens. That there's going to be prayers for breaking of addiction. I pray that that addiction breaks for reconciliation of family, for provision, God, whatever these prayers are. I pray that you exchange the cloak of the past with the gift of the future that you have for them. Jesus, we thank you and we praise you in your name. And everybody said, amen. Let's worship God together. Who am I that the highest king would Lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Praise God. You know, one sign that you're willing to get out of the jar and get off the curb and and tap into that untapped potential and stop limiting yourselves with false identities and the lies that you've heard. One sign is when Bartimaeus starts crying out and he uses his voice. And so if you're in the house today and you have that faith, you say, God, I want all you have for me. Would you speak out? Would you say, praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Would you say, praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. God hears you today. He is ministering among us. And we're believing that God would take you to that next place. 
that you would keep showing up and persevere, push through with Jesus. If you made a decision for salvation today, would you go to the hello spot? We wanna give you a free gift, put a Bible in your hands and help you take next steps right here at Trinity. We're gonna continue singing this song. Would you sing it uh, at the top of your lungs and lift up Jesus, amen. Chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, I am chosen not forsaken. Express your appreciation to Pastor Terry Parkman for coming and being with us today, sharing God's word. Thank you. Thanks, brother. I know we're going to see him again. Um, hey, I just want to let you know, there's 30 groups meeting this week that want to connect you into community, and water baptism is two weeks away. We're going to say, and my faith leads my life. If that's you, swing by the hello spot today. We'd love to get you signed up. Let me pray over you as you go uh, from this house and you go to contextualize and represent the good news in our world. Jesus, thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to um, God be healed by you for your work. Lord, I pray that we would be extensions of your grace this week all over Baltimore and the surrounding areas. Lord, advance your kingdom. We cannot wait, God, to gather back here again together to testify to the goodness that's about to roll out before us this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. We love you, church. We'll see you on Sunday.